good to see you all back after this uh, break, but you know a break is also a time for actually advancing and growing in well, in our life, in our spiritual life, and uh, travel and vacation and retreat, both of which I did, or all of which I did recently, uh, are excellent ways to do that. Uh, travel brings you, you know, it's new, new uh, places, uh, makes you relaxed, uh, you know, it gets you out of your customary ruts and, you know, molds, uh, and so you're, you know, a priori more open to, to reality and to new experience. And so you often get, as I did, new insights, uh, maybe not new theoretical, new theoretical insights, but, you know, a deeper practical uh, experience of, you know, what, we're, what we are and what we're looking for. I'm sharing that a bit on Facebook with a uh, high school friend of mine who had just taken a trip around the world. And that was his experience as well with his wife. Um, and uh, I reminded him that uh, you know, the Kabbalah has that as well, you know, the spiritual almost necessity of travel in order to grow. Anyway, so this time, <laughs> this time as I was on the balcony of my cruise ship going down the Mexican coast, um, you know, looking out over the water. Uh, you know, I was reading uh, Ilya DeLeo's uh, The Franciscan Sisters, uh, wonderful book from a few years ago uh, called uh, Christ and Evolution. And there's, you know, in the opening chapter, she speaks uh, also very much the way uh, Elizabeth Johnson, uh, the CSJ, uh, the Sister of St. Joseph, uh, Professor Fordham, uh, also just recently wrote a book that I mentioned here before on, on Darwin and the God of Love on evolution. And no mistake or no coincidence that they're both written by women. Women tend to be more sensitive to the mysteries of the, you know, created universe than men do or kind of live in their heads. Uh, so uh, anyway, she, uh, they were both, both point out the scientific evidence, not just from Darwin, but then also, you know, physics, modern physics, and, uh, about just how much the world is in motion and in change. The, the world uh, that we Christians had, the Greek world, tended to be rather static. It was the heaven and the earth, and they were there, plop. And we worked out our destiny here below, and God was up in heaven helping us out, hopefully. And, uh, you know, finally we would go back up to heaven and join him, and then finally the world would be destroyed and so on. Who cares? Uh, but that's not how it works, thank God. Um, uh, even even in the Eastern systems, you know, as I'll say in a moment, you know, Buddhists have been much more sensitive to the fact that everything is changing and nothing is stable. Uh, it tended to be kind of a static worldview, nonetheless. You know, where we're just here trying to achieve enlightenment, and you know, in this you know, whatever it is, um, and uh, it tended to be, if anything, uh, especially in the Hindu system with the kalpas, which. The, Buddhists took over, also the idea of ages of the world, and we, there was the golden age, and now if anything, we're going backward, we're going down, uh, degenerating, rather than actually moving forward. So all that is challenged by, by modern science, and it actually is a big lift to our spirituality, and as I'll say, it fits in, actually, with the deepest in intuitions of, of all the systems, hmm? as well as challenging them. Uh, so I had, I had a strong sense, I mean, uh, wow, you know, the atom, is mostly space and the uncertainty principle, you know, as you know, you, you can't tell because you're, when, as soon as you engage in the observation, you change the whole equation and you can't say that an electron is here or there. So there's this, just this swirl of energy, uh, all these swirls of energy which make up, quote, things that are supposedly stable, but most of the time it's just space and energy, and matter is energy, as Einstein pointed out. So the universe is just this, this, this constant effusion uh, and fusion and fission of energy going on all the time, this tremendous energy interaction. If anything, which in our <coughs> system mirrors the Trinity, mirrors this constant energy exchange, which is, the, which is the Trinity. And of course, the Trinity is the creator. Well, then of course, the world's going to mirror that. Uh, but in any case, there's, there's this sense that, that, there's, that there's a movement, a constant movement uh, of energy. Now, Teilhard de Chardin, the, the, the great uh, mystic philosopher, uh, Jesuit in the uh, early to mid uh, 20th century, had, had very much integrated this into his Christianity. 
So I see an evolutionary view where everything is evolving not only from Christ but toward Christ, towards the absolute fulfillment uh, in someone who is not only the word through which all things were made, but the Christ, the human, um, who is the word incarnate, uh, in whom all things are destined, to whom all things are destined. As St. Paul says in Colossians, all things were created through him and for him, and in all, thi in all things uh, hold together. So this is actually a very ancient view, it's a scriptural view. Not to mention people like Gregory of Nyssa and his disciple Maximus the Confessor, the, the fathers of the church who had this strong sense of an, evol of an evolutionary movement, of, of a moving constantly forward, in other words, uh, toward, towards the fulfillment. Uh, so this is uh, both a recovery of and a challenge to, you know, the Christian, our Christian, view, our Christian theology and our Christian spirituality, to see this, um, what uh, Sister Elia DeLeo calls, you know, using others' thought as well, the second axial period. Whereas the first axial period that Carl Jaspers made famous, uh, you know, that time around 600 BC, when the great religions and great Greek culture and all began to, to form in, for self-consciousness and self-awareness in a deeper way. Now, suppose we propose, we're in a second axial period where we have a global consciousness of this movement, the global evolutionary consciousness of spirit and towards spirit and through spirit to greater spirit, uh, when we all come together. You know, Teilhard called it the Omega Point uh, the, uh, of Christ. Um, and uh, we share you know, in, in that movement and, and should be contributing to that fulfillment as we all come together in that uh, global evolution. Um, and it's a, it's, it's a very, very powerful and energizing view of, of how spirit works in the world. And then it fits in with the basic Christian view that all will be fulfilled in Christ in the end. But it involves the whole universe, the whole universe. As St. Paul says, the whole universe is groaning in expectation and labor pains, actually, uh, waiting for the revelation of the sons of God, of our coming to full consciousness. Uh, uh, Teilhard also called Christianity the phylum, to use the zoological language, the phylum of love, saying we shouldn't be, and this is something I think Raymond Pandekar, uh, uh, famous uh, Christian Hindu, Christian priest and Hindu, uh, said is, is uh, 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 the uh, you know, a movement toward uh, 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 what he called a homeomorphic, where the, the religions uh, come together and you know, have different perspectives on the one basic reality of, 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 of move, moving, moving forward. Uh, so that uh, he called, he, he said that Christianity is in danger of being just a, a static species that's stuck in itself and doesn't open up to the fullness of uh, the creative spirit of love, which brings all, all together. Now, this actually does fit also very well in, 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 into, into, into the Buddhist view, as I just said, where there's nothing substantial, everything is in movement, dependent co-arising, the basic Buddhist philosophical view that everything is connected to everything else, which modern science confirms, so that we're not separate individuals doing our own thing, but everything influences everything else in kind of this dynamic interplay. Uh, but a modern uh, Buddhist, Zen, Zen Buddhist philosopher, you know, Japanese, Masao Abe, has this notion of dynamic shunyata, dynamic emptiness. Hmm? So that this emptiness is not just there, but static there, as I said before, but it's dynamic. It is actually moving in the direction. Um, and if compassion is, as all these religions recognize, is the ultimate reality, the ultimate truth of the world, then it should be moving in this direction of love and compassion. And that should be the substance of reality that we enter more and more deeply into. So just a sense you can know, hang loose and be open to the movement of the spirit, you know, towards greater love, greater union, uh, greater expansion of our true self, uh, which uh, is that the truth uh, of one another and of the whole universe. This is, this is a very liberating uh, way to live, not just a way to see, but a way to live. And another uh, insight connected to this that I had with, with uh, some, doing some breath work in a, in a brief retreat I was in at a Franciscan house uh, in California, in, in Malibu actually, it, it was just how much spirit and matter really are one, one experienced reality. Duh! I mean, this is actually 
it's challenging to realize that more and more deeply, but it's the, it's the truth of both what Christianity and Zen have been saying and insisting on all along. The incarnation. Human nature and divine nature are one person. And that should be our reality, as we're more and more transformed into Christ, so that, and this is the experience you can have with this kind of approach to spirituality, is in my very physicality, in my breath, uh, in my movement, in my just being in my body, I can experience God. It's right there. And Zen has been insisting on this, you know, all along, that it's right Emptiness is form, form is emptiness. There's no separation between emptiness and form, absolute and relative. It's all right there. So that in the tree in the garden or in the, uh, in the stone on the road, you can experience God. In the Gospel of Thomas, Jesus says, if you see a stone, there are minds. It's, it's the same idea. That there's just no separation of dimensions. And I, and I questioned myself and I asked myself, well, well, of course, I've tried to live this, I've intellectually absorbed this, but to have a deeper and deeper experience of, no, really, don't even think of two different things, absolute and relative, or emptiness and form, or matter and spirit. I mean, it's just, wow, it really is right here. No separation. And it goes for sexuality as well, you know, in our body. You know, if it's lived in that you know, sense of, uh, as it was said in my retreat, cosmic generosity, because it's openness. Uh, and that's, of course, what the systems of uh, you know, tantric, tantric systems have said all along, that, or the Song of Songs, you know, in, in the Jew Judeo-Christian tradition, that it's right here in that experience you can experience God. So, as you see, it, it's a deeper and deeper waking up to something we already know and hopefully have already uh, initially, you know, encodably experienced, but just to go deeper and deeper into it, facilitated by this experience of getting outside our ordinary, you know, uh, boundaries, uh, uh, physically and intellectually spiritually. And uh, another aspect of this, which fits in with one of, uh, uh, one of the Zen, page, Zen calendar's page a day things that came up on August 4th, it was a quote apparently from Bodhidharma, who was the Indian founder of Zen in China in the uh, 5th century BC. Um, the quote was, you know, if you stop clinging to things and really let go, you'll be free. Free even from birth and death and you'll transform everything. Wow. If you stop taking the things and let them be, you'll be free. Free even from birth and death. And you'll transform everything. Now I like to go back to the original language, but I can't do that in <laughs> Chinese and Japanese or Pali. Uh, and I'd like to, because it's a very modern sounding translation, isn't it? You know, we're talking about you'll transform everything. I wonder what the word really is for transform there. I mean, is it really transformers? I mean, it should be. The point is, because that is how the transformation takes place. If you have an agenda, if you already have your own idea about exactly how, uh, or what it means, exactly how the universe is supposed to be evolving, uh, then you'll wind up imposing your view or just a conceptual understanding, which is what Zen is always trying to shake us out of that, away from. So stop clinging to your agenda, no matter how lofty it may seem, um, and uh, you'll be free. Free to allow what we call the Spirit of God, or whatever, the, the dynamic shunyata, uh, to work in you and through you, uh, to bring about something you couldn't possibly have imagined or defined, or, you know, or hold it. You, know. you can't hold on to it, you can't imagine it, and you have to actually let it happen, happen in you. Uh, so this is, uh, this is a, a, an exciting thing. And this is what, for example, my teacher's teacher, Roshi Bernie Glassman, is, is always insisting on. Uh, actually simply respond, if you're enlightened, what you'll do is you'll actually simply respond wholly and organically and sincerely and authentically to the situation as it is here and now. No theoretical constructs, you know, or agendas, what's right in front of you. Uh, and you only need to, uh, as one, as one Christian once told Jimmy Carter, you know, in his early life, and he always remembered it. All you have to worry about is loving God and the person right in front of you right now. Same idea. The presence of God in your immediate circumstances in Christian spirituality. So the same idea. Don't have an agenda. 
uh, you'll be free that way, free from birth and death of what you think is birth and death, because those are just constructs. It's all just life, different phases and forms of life. Um, and you'll transform everything. That's the key. If you really live that way, you'll be taken up into this flow of evolutionary global consciousness, which is the consciousness of Christ, the Buddha nature, Buddha consciousness, the, the ultimate reality of the world, which includes everything, which is everything, uh, that, that we're called to whatever the system. So you see, part of this global consciousness is, is uh, interestingly enough, bringing together the various traditions of the world, the various spiritual and uh, religious traditions of the world. And, uh, as you see, kind of challenging them, uh, and in the process discovering, well, actually part of the deepest inspiration and reality of what these traditions are saying, have been saying all along, is actually this. But we realize it better now. And kind of give it a, give it a, a little nuanced twist, you know, in that direction, which was already there. Uh, but that's part of the global consciousness, is the religious and spiritual, inter-spiritual, inter-religious global consciousness that, that, that is dynamically evolving and that, that, we, should, that we, we can be part of. Uh, we are part of it, you know, whether we want, it or want to or not, and we need to uh, allow that to happen in, in us. So uh, that's a way of uh, you know, seeing that that's part of the global consciousness itself and, uh, and, and allowing that to forward. Uh, so we hope that we can, um, you know, e evolve in this way and uh, not remain stuck in, either, in, in, either as institutions or as systems or as individuals, you know, uh, in uh, a partial and inadequate uh, view uh, which will prevent our you know, becoming fully who we're, who we're called to be. So uh, those were some of the uh, experiences and insights that I had that I had here in this, and I, and I think it's uh, it is important in this second axial period uh, to connect to what's really happening you know, within each tradition and within and between among the traditions uh, to have this dynamic view. And whether, and I conclude with this, what that means for the physical universe, you know, well. It, it's obviously included in New Heavens and New Earth, you know, as theologians have been saying all along, it's, it's somehow this transformed. How it will be transformed? Will it mean that the, uh, an endless cycle of universes, the universe expanding and then contracting back and forth, the different you know, universes coming back and forth, and, uh, the uh, melting of all the elements and all of that, uh, uh, is that how it's going to happen? Who knows? Either way, or however, it does involve the physical universe because there's only one reality. And either way, or however, the key is, as all these thinkers are saying, the key is uh, the evolution of our human consciousness, which was the cutting edge, it still is the cutting edge of evolution, um, the evolution of our consciousness to be consciousness itself, however you call it, which we already are and need to wake up to, and that will have some effect on the physical universe. How could it not? Because there's only one reality. Um, and what that, how that manifests, who knows? We'll have to wait and see. Or we'll have to wake up and see. Uh, so let go of what we expect in our systems again, you know, that don't cling, and be surprised. Same as Pope Francis keeps saying, you know, God is a God of surprises. You can't predict where it's going. The spirit blows where it wills, and you don't know where it's going. Uh, but it would be wonderful. So let's sleep into that walk or flight of wonderful and allow that to happen in us and through us. Yes.